Here for the introduction, you missed what that was about. We had five different languages going on the screens here, and you saw them at home. And it was, uh, let me see if I can get this right. Veronica was doing Portuguese, and Julie Martel was doing uh, Spanish, and Lucy Mann was doing French, and Susan was doing Swiss German, German, yep. And Robin Zimmerman was doing English, although you couldn't hear it, <laughs> without an English accent. <laughs> uh, for those of you that are here, please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still do not, you do not know me? Whoever has seen the Father, has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated for those of you that are here. <clears throat> well, as we continue to celebrate this Pentecost Sunday, Pentecost, which we as Christians celebrate as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the church blossomed at that point and the Lord did incredible things through his people. But really the roots of Pentecost go back to the Jewish days because it was a Jewish feast first before it became a Christian celebration of the Holy Spirit. And if you look at the, the Jewish feasts and festivals throughout the Old Testament and the ones that the Jews even celebrate today, there are various festivals and feasts, but the three primary ones that uh, we hear about often, uh, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which is the final harvest, Passover, 
which we talk about Jesus, our Passover sacrifice for us, was actually the Passover lamb. And we believe that Jesus is the Passover lamb once for all for our sin. And then you've got this strange feast called Pentecost. And I say strange because most people, if you were to ask what the Old Testament roots of Pentecost are, they would say, well, I'm not sure. And it's the feast of first fruits. And so it was the early harvest, the spring harvest. But it was also connected in the Old Testament to the Word of God. So there's a dual connection to that. And if you think about the word penta, penta is 50 days after, penta 50, 50 days after Passover. And it's interesting that for the Jewish people, they celebrated Pentecost because it was the first harvest. And for Christians, it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the church, the people of God, began to be harvested by the apostles because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Penta 50 is also connected to the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee being the year that all debt was forgiven in the Jewish community and all slaves were released. And so it's rather interesting that you have those two aspects of both the Jewish faith and the Christian faith that are juxtaposed with each other because in many ways the Passover lamb is Jesus the sacrifice for sin and then you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gathering of the first fruits when the Apostles began to preach and do their ministry so the meanings been transformed by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the ministry of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church let me draw another analogy for you. We just passed a holiday in our national calendar. It was Memorial Day. A absolutely, Memorial Day. And what did Memorial Day celebrate? It celebrated those who have laid down their life for the sake of our freedom. And what holiday is the next national holiday we will celebrate? Fourth of July, which is the freedom given to us that we've received. Isn't that interesting? That we have that kind of reflected in our national calendar. That you have people that have died so that we might have freedom and then we celebrate the freedom. And that's what we as Christians do. We celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and then we experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that frees us. Frees us from our sin frees us from our slavery from sin. I think that's a wonderful juxtaposition of all of those, the Jewish holidays, the Christian holidays, the national holidays, that all weave in these themes of freedom. And in our case, especially, freedom from sin. Freedom from the slavery of sin. Freedom in Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit poured out poured into us that Jesus promised we experience because of his death and his resurrection and his going to the right hand of the Father when he said I will send you the Holy Spirit to empower you so that's what we're celebrating today and uh, it's interesting because if you were to just trace the Holy Spirit and how Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit through the Gospel of John. It's wonderful to just do that, especially since I love the Gospel of John. You have Nicodemus, and Jesus talks about the wind blows where he will, but you must be born again, born from above, born by the gift of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the first. And then just fast forward a little bit to John 7 and springs of living water which will well up in us and overflow onto other people how God's grace has been poured out to us and then we become vessels of his grace and vessels of his love for other people that God begins to do his work through his people and then in the upper room with the apostles John 13 through 17 which is the most elaborate teaching about the person of the Holy Spirit that Jesus refers to and how the Holy Spirit points us to the truth about Jesus Christ. And so Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. 
And then we have in our gospel reading for today, specifically from John 14, where the Holy Spirit, if you look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit throughout John 14, you see Jesus pointed to as the way, the truth, and the life. You see him pointed to as God himself, the second person of the Trinity. You see him pointed to that no one can come to the Father except through Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is revealing these truths and will continue to reveal those truths to us. And we need to reveal those truths to other people. That's part of what happened on Pentecost. That when the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, that's when they began their ministry of truly in earnest preaching the gospel without fear as they went out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And one other thing I want to point out, when I always talk about the Holy Spirit, I always talk about how this is not a force, okay? We're not talking Star Wars. We're not talking about a thing. We're talking about the third person of the, Holy, of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And if you listen to, and I actually teach this in my new members class, Jesus said in verse uh, 16 of our reading, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Another advocate means someone just like him who will draw alongside them to be their comforter, to be their defender, to be with them always, as Jesus says in Matthew 28. That's the Holy Spirit. This is a person like Jesus, only in spirit. So in spirit, he can be in you. He can be in me. He can be everywhere. Not confined to one place or one person like Jesus chose to be in one person, one human flesh. The Holy Spirit is available to all of us. That's the blessing. That's the gift. That's what we celebrate at Pentecost. And I want to talk about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in this reading from Acts chapter 2. The manifestation that we see, what's the first manifestation that we see of the Holy Spirit? The wind. And it talks about a powerful wind. And a powerful wind that filled the room. Now, a lot of you know that I love weather. And some of you know, and to some of the people in this church, their chagrin, we stayed for Hurricane Matthew. And if you've never lived through something like that, and thank God we lived through it, it is so powerful and awesome. The force of a hurricane, 100, 105, 110 miles an hour, whatever it is, I've never lived through, but I have been close to a tornado. The force of wind of tornadoes far greater than hurricanes. 200, 300 miles per hour. Jeff Partlow wrote a book on that. And it's an amazing story, but the power of a tornado. And in both cases, you don't know exactly where it's going to blow and how it's going to be. In both cases, we have these hurricane predictions that predict from the tip of Florida up into Maine, and the whole coast evacuates because they don't know. That's the wind. We don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit is going to move in and around us. We don't know. We seek. We allow ourselves to be filled. And if you look throughout Scripture, there's wonderful examples of how the wind operates and where the wind shows up. The first in the, the book of Job where there's a powerful whirlwind in the, world, the, in the whirlwind. The Lord spoke from the whirlwind to Job to talk about who he is and what that means for Job amidst his struggle and his pain and all the destruction and devastation that happened around him in his life and how the Lord lifted him. And then we think about Elijah 
and the powerful wind, and after the powerful wind, the Lord speaks in a still small voice to his heart. And one of the great visions found in Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones. When all these dry bones have flesh put on them and they're alive. And that brings us to the other manifestation of this, of this Holy Spirit working. And what the word means. Ruach in the Old Testament. Wind also means breath. God wants to breathe life into us. Life. Not dullness. Not selfishness. Not living in a little cocoon. Life. We have this life. We have this breath. This power of the Holy Spirit that we have access to to transform us. If God can change all that. And then he brings this, this teaching to Nicodemus who was supposedly one of the most well-educated Jewish Pharisee on the Sanhedrin who just didn't understand. Because the Holy Spirit has to blow into your, into your life, spiritually, transforming you so that you have this spiritual life about you, this breath. Secondly, the fire. I not only like wind, I like fire. I love to sit out at a fire pit and just watch the fire. We used to gather Christmas trees around our neighborhood, 80, 100 trees, and light a bonfire. It was incredible. I used to love that. Fire. Again, it bespeaks power. Power that we can't always control. We see these wildfires that burn out of control. And yet at the same time, when we think of fire, like a fire pit, like a fireplace, we think of warmth. And both of those ideas are contained in what happened on Pentecost. There was this powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles, on the early church. And they moved with that power out from their fears. And they operated with that love, the warmth. So their zeal and there's compassion and they're brought together by the Holy Spirit working in us. That's meant to be who we are. With the Holy Spirit working in us, this zeal and this compassion. And there's this reference to tongues of fire. It's a manifestation for our sake. So that we understand that this inward reality has an outward reality to reveal to the apostles and to those around, this is real. This is the work of the Holy Spirit burning in their hearts, so much so that they moved out. They moved out from a place that used to represent fear in the upper room when they hid when Jesus was crucified. Even in the upper room after they heard that Jesus had risen. And in the upper room as they prayed after Jesus ascended for this outpouring, for the Holy Spirit to come, which we need to do as well, every day, to invite the Holy Spirit to fill us and transform us, each person, every person. And then the actual speaking in tongues bespeaks another ministry and power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Maybe not all here speak in tongues. Languages have always been difficult for me. I used to have to take them, high school, college, seminary, I was great at memorization, not good at languages. There's a difference. But the language that the Holy Spirit speaks to us is the language of God's Word for us. And the language that we speak to others may not be the manifestation of tongues like we see, but God will give us the words to say to other people that are beyond what we're capable of. God has a way of taking us beyond ourselves because he is able, because he is powerful, 
because when we open ourselves to the outpouring of his Holy Spirit, he takes us and uses us, and he wants to get his word out. He wants other people to know the gospel, the compassion, the power, the transforming power of God in our hearts and our lives. That's what his desire is for us. It's not just about being obedient. It's not just about God's holiness. It is about those. It's not just God providing for our needs. It's more than that. That our characters, our person, is transformed by his grace. That whatever we're dealing with, he has the power to transform us and then use us. Because he wants to get his word out. He wants us to touch other lives. You know, when I begin to think about what happened at Pentecost, I thought about this thing. I'm not usually this kind of preacher, but the three R's. Okay, the first is remission, which is another word for forgiveness, which is related to the word repentance. It's that God has dealt with our sin. That is the most important aspect. Because of our sin, we are broken. Because of our sin, we separate ourselves from God. Because of our sin, we have broken relationships amongst us. All we need to do is watch the news and we see it over and over again. There's so much brokenness in our country, in our world, and it's primarily because of sin. And when we allow God's gospel that comes to us through Jesus Christ, that comes to us through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our minds, God can bring transformation, forgiveness, remission, of sin. That's the first star. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, we read, the sting of death is sin. And that's why God has to deal with that. Because otherwise, our, not only are our bodies decaying, but our lives will decay. Our relationships will decay. And God wants to bring that transformation, that life. The second, after we receive, after we repent, after we experience that remission, that forgiveness of our sin, truly, truly, completely, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, the power of the resurrection, then we experience regeneration where that which is deteriorating in us or was deteriorating in us, because we are operating in our flesh, because we are operating within our own will and power, God begins to transform. This regeneration that happens in our lives can happen in relationships because of God's power working in us when we allow the Holy Spirit to take over instead of us taking over. Regeneration. Life. Life from a decaying body. You know, yesterday, Meredith and I, we've been praying for David and June Smith here at St. Luke's for over 20 years. We've been supporting them as missionaries, first in the U Ukraine and then with international students in the United States. Oh, about six or seven years ago, David was diagnosed with... Uh, an illness called ataxia. It's very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. And his body was deteriorating. And all during that time, he continued to be a witness to the Lord. June sent Meredith a text, I believe it was last Friday or Saturday, when we were away visiting our son Daniel and his family, that David took a turn for the worse. And so Meredith and I FaceTimed David and June. And it was literally less than 24 hours before he died. And we had a wonderful visit with the two of them. And David, in spite of his condition, smiled. And actually had a sense of humor. We were talking and it was funny exchange and 
June, who is often his translator because he's very difficult to understand. He was very difficult to understand toward the end. She translated something, she got it wrong, and David kind of signaled to her to come back so he could, she could translate again. And she turned to us and said, he just said I'm a terrible translator. <laughs> and he smiled. This is less than 24 hours before he's dying, and he knows he's going to die. And to hear the testimonies around his life yesterday at the service, David was always smiling, always bringing the presence of the Lord into situations, any situation. His gentleness, his kindness, his smile, his joy. Because he knew, ultimately, his body would be regenerated for all eternity. And he manifested that now, even with a deteriorating body. Physically, not spiritually. He was a powerful witness throughout his life and throughout his dying. And it was a wonderful, uplifting service, not without tears, but tremendously uplifting. Redemption, the third R. He has redeemed us. He's paid the price for us, which is what the word redeem means. And if he's paid a price for us, we empty ourselves so that we can be filled with this Holy Spirit. Redeemed. And the outward results that we see in Scripture, as Acts, un Acts 2 unfolds on that day of Pentecost, what you begin to see that happened in the early church, that happened in the apostles, a steadfastness. There are so many Christians that wax and wane in their faith, wax and wane in their commitment to the Lord, wax and wane in what they bear in their lives, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of ministry, the fruit of generosity and servanthood and sacrificial love. Steadfastness, that we bear with one another, that we love one another, that we sacrifice ourselves. Steadfastness, we can't do ourselves. Joy. You know, there's a lot of people that are joyless right now. We can always spread joy. I love to spread joy. I really do. And I do it in a variety of ways, but I love to bring joy into people's lives. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love and joy and peace. When we have that peace that passes understanding. You know, Jesus in the upper room, he was going to die in less than 24 hours. Sounds very familiar to David. And what did he talk about? The prayer that he prayed for joy, complete joy for them. And when he showed up in the upper room after the resurrection, their fear turned into peace and joy because he, they were reassured of his love. It was the power of the cross and then the power of the resurrection and then the power of the Holy Spirit that made this permanent. The fruit of the Spirit flowing out from them. And worship. How many people see worship as mundane, as optional, as not a priority? When what you see in the early church, they gathered together constantly. That's why the church had such power. Because they never neglected gathering as the community of the faithful, inviting the Holy Spirit where two or three are gathered together in his name. There he was. And it's meant to be a foretaste of heaven. You know what the world thinks is a foretaste of heaven? They miss it because it is so fleeting. God wants to begin his work of eternal life in us now by the Holy Spirit working in us, bringing that new life, that regeneration, that transformation, even though this body is decaying, this physical body. He transforms us in our character, in our grace, in our love, in our joy, in our reaching out to others with the Word of God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is Pentecost.
Let's pray that the Holy Spirit is poured out on us today and every day. And that we, like the early church, would move powerfully because of the wind and the fire and the tongues. Let's pray. Lord God, so often we neglect the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. How by your grace, we know the gospel. And by faith, we know the gift of the cross and the resurrection. Lord, help us to realize it's by the ministry of the Holy Spirit working in us that we can even claim Jesus as Savior and Lord. And Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, we can be transformed more and more into the image of Christ, more and more. Greater works than these, Jesus said, because of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. Lord, I pray that for those who don't know you right now, that they would open their hearts to the truth of the gospel, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, of pointing to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, the power of the cross and the resurrection, and for all of us, that we would be willing to see how sin can grip us, how brokenness can seize us, how fear can control us and imprison us, and how we can become free by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, that we might be vessels of grace for those around us. Pour out your Holy Spirit now. Holy Spirit, come. Fill our hearts and change our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.